Cash used Luther Perkins on guitar, and he was a guy of limited technical ability, uh, to the point that it would frustrate Cash sometimes, but Cash's producer at Sun Records, Sam Phillips, loved it. He would take Luther's guitar away after a recording session so that he could not practice. He wanted him to be able to go da 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 Because you're mine, I walk the line. It's got that raw, lean rhythm. It's a guitar and an acoustic and an upright bass and snare drum. I mean, there's nothing on the record, and that's what makes it intense. If uh, any of the guards are still speaking to me, could I have a glass of water? The live albums recorded at Folsom Prison in 1968 and San Quentin State Prison in 1969 came to symbolize everything he stood for. Cash took country music back where he thought it belonged, to the common man who had fallen from grace. The man in black with his stripped back sound within the bare walls of a prison was a stark reminder of country's dirt poor roots. San Quentin, you've been living hell to me. You blistered me since 1963. We always love the underdog, the outsider, the bad boy. That's, that's who we all want to identify with. Nobody wants to be part of, uh, nobody wants to identify with the prison guard, the warden. Those are the, the people that are our oppressors. So the, the everyman is the, the guy behind the bars. San Quentin, I hate every inch of you. He had a connection uh, with those prisoners. There's the, a lot of people assume that Cash himself had been to prison. He never had, he'd been to jail, but not, uh, not to prison. There were points, particularly during the San Quentin concert, when if he had just gone, okay, break, he could have started a riot with that gravitas and that, that trembling voice of his. Merle Haggard was a prisoner in San Quentin the day Johnny Cash came to perform. It gave him the idea that singing for the common man could be a career. There was a guard, a prison guard, that was standing over at the side of the stage chewing gum. And Cash looked over at this guard and started mocking that guard. And immediately this put the whole prison in the, in the palm of his hand when he done that. Well, he, every convict there loved him because he was, he was able to smart off to a guard and get away with it. And I thought, man, this guy has got more stage presence than anybody ever seen. Cash could only imagine life in a Californian prison, but Merle Haggard was the real deal. The warden, Say goodbye like a rest. And I heard him tell the warden just before he reached my set. Let my guitar play and friend do my request. This experience gave credibility to his songs. Merle Haggard had the authenticity that sometimes Nashville only pretended to have. It's a big job just getting by with nine kids and a wife. Yeah, but I've been a working man, dang near all my life, and I'll keep on working. It's certainly something that in many cases has given voice to the commoner, you know, to the common man. Um, people have called Merle Haggard, a, a poet of the common man, and certainly he is uh, a, an incredible country singer-songwriter. We don't smoke marijuana in Muskogee. We don't take our trips on LSD. In the 1960s, as Merle rose to fame, America was being torn apart by the Vietnam War. It had become anti-war long hairs versus the patriotic silent majority. The voice of the common man, the core audience of country music, wasn't being heard at all until Mel Haggard sang Oki from Muskogee. 
like he has told different stories about his relation to that song at different parts of his life. The original version, which the country audience wanted to buy into, is that it was absolutely serious. You know, this is a song for all the people in Muskogee, USA, who hate hippies and people with, you know, protesting the war and all of this. We don't let our hair go long and shaggy, nasty, filthy, like the hippies out in San Francisco do. Oki from Muskogee teased the liberals about their long hair and LSD. It was a song of the moment which viewed the radical hippies of San Francisco through the disapproving eyes of small town America. Well, it may have cost me a lot of fans, actually. I wrote something that represented a lot of people that the, the, the downtrod, the, uh, the uh, underdog, the, uh, the guy that uh, don't bitch about everything. You know, the guy was still proud of, didn't need to be cool. I think that's what it said. You don't have to be cool to be great, you know. The blue-collar worldview of country music makes it an easy target for those at the cutting edge of new political thinking. But sometimes, by following its heart, it comes out ahead of the game. For you to wear. You've got to kiss an angel good morning, let her know you think about her when you go. Kiss an angel good morning, and love her like the devil when you get back home. What's wrong with that? As the civil rights movement began to change attitudes in the southern states, an African American called Charlie Pride took to the stage of the Grand Old Opry to sing what had always been called White Man's Blues. Sweetheart, I'll give you all my love in every way I can. But make sure that's what you want while you're still free. I mean, the most obvious thing about Charlie Pride, and it's not always the thing that Charlie would want to have talked about first, but you can't help but notice that he's the most successful Afri African-American country singer in the history of the genre. It was, in some ways, a new thing to happen. There were country songs sung by black people, there was, black, there was various sorts of black music that worked their way into country, but somebody who was singing outright honky-tonk music with the same kind of backup as every other country singer, whose vocal mannerisms were born of the Grand Ole Opry and Hank Williams and, 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 and not of Memphis, <laughs> you know, but I like country songs was a new thing to succeed. It wasn't easy, but he made it work. When people heard him sing, it worked because he sounds like a classic country singer. Does anybody go out in the San Antonio, Phoenix, Arizona? Any place is all right as long as I can forget I've ever known her. My oldest sister used to say, well, are you singing their songs? This is my oldest sister same mother. Why are you singing their song? I said, well, no, it's my songs too, if I want to sing them. I would sing what I heard on the Grand Ole Opry, like Ernest Tubb and uh, Eddie Arnold and all the one, all those guys. And uh, so I emulated them. Does anybody go out in the San Antonio or Phoenix, Arizona? Any place is all right as long. The fact that he wanted to sing Hank Williams songs and the songs about crystal chandeliers, and he sang songs about class and it kind of, you know, you're going to go off to your rich friend with the crystal chandeliers. He transcended race because it was really great country music. Despite the breakthrough of Charlie Pride, country music couldn't shake off its redneck reputation. By the 70s, long hair and drugs were everywhere except the Grand Old Opry. Merle Haggard's Oki from Muskogee had suggested there was no place for hippies in country music, but soon the barbarians would be at the gates of Nashville itself.
Under the influence of the times, Waylon Jennings and Willie Nelson started playing a different sort of country music. Every generation probably wants to say their music is, is the real one. And I think in a way the outlaw music was just a, a representation of what was going on in the world, that people were now, instead of drinking whiskey, they were smoking pot. So they needed some country music that went along with that. It appealed to everybody. It appealed to the rednecks, to the hippies, to the rock and rollers, to everybody. The movement became known as the Outlaws after the 1976 album that sold a million copies. It looked like a wanted poster from the Wild West and established the straggly beard as the must-have accessory of modern country music. In the end, it all comes back to the singing cowboy films. But Waylon and Willie didn't want to be on the side of law and order. Their heroes were the outsiders, not the sheriff. Sometimes the bad guys were the most interesting ones in the movies, as we know. And so it's, it's fun, I think, to look at the rock and roll guys and also people like Johnny Cash and Waylon Jennings, who migrated towards the black hat, the black clothes, and, you know, people like Keith Richards, Ringo Starr have talked about how they were really influenced by the cowboys and the westerns, but they definitely went for that outlaw look. All the outlaws were just kind of doing it their way, and then the business or the system caught on, oh, wow, this is a, uh, they look a little rough, but wow, they're actually drawing in country people and hippies and bikers and business people all in the same roof, you know? So it, it opened up a lot of doors. That's for sure. The Outlaws broadened the audience for country music and helped it lose its uptight image. But that was nothing compared to the impact of a woman from the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee who set her sights on global domination. Dolly Parton struck gold with a formula that still endures to this day. She was more hillbilly than ever, but she wrapped it up in bright new packaging.